All right. Today's lecture is uh, very special. And uh, the reason for that is not what you think. It is uh, really a perfect finale for the course because, you know, like in the movies, when uh, at, the last, at the last scene, at the last five minutes, the plot is revealed, this is, a, this is that moment for our course. So all the topics that I covered with you, you may wonder why did I switch from superconductors to semiconductors to qubits. It all comes together in this one lecture. This topic, my Uranus, could be just as well a review of the entire course. So you need to understand all of the course that we covered before, well, most of it, to understand this one. So I will be reviewing some of the topics very briefly as we go along. But you will see that the added concepts that we introduced today are very minimal and probably right at the beginning of the talk. And the rest you should be able to just understand if you followed the course. So once again, um, Majorana fermions are particles that are their own antiparticles, but you can uh, simply in mathematical terms rewrite these uh, conventional um, operators for creation and annihilation of uh, conventional fermions like electrons in terms of Majorana operators. You have to do it like this. So you just uh, write very formally that the creation of an electron is uh, a superposition of two Majorana operators. And an annihilation of an electron is a another superposition of two Majorana operators. So this is a linear transformation. So you can do all your second quantization uh, that you've learned for fermions in the basis of uh, these Majorana operators. And um, yeah, you can, you can extract the Majorana operators out of here and you can see that they represent equal superpositions of creation and annihilation of real fermions. So that's why in this big cartoon they are depicted by half filled or half empty circles because they are particles that are equal superpositions of creation or annihilation. If we're talking about Majoranas in a solid state, then they are an equal to superposition of an electron and a hole, creation and annihilation, electron and a hole. So if you take any of these operators and do take a complex conjugate of uh, gamma 1 or gamma 2, you will get the same operator. Yeah, so this one is real. It will remain the same. This one is complex, so it will just be multiplied by a sign. So it will be the same. Now this is just math. But of course, the interesting question is, can we create these uh, particles in, a, in, in or can we observe them, or can we create them in a, in a real sample? And for that, there are uh, many different considerations. Uh, and the uh, evolution of these ideas, particularly in solid state, goes back about uh, uh, 15 or 20 years. Um, but here is a, a first. Uh, thing that comes to mind, ah, electron and a hole. Let's take one electron and one hole, put them together. Uh, that's an exciton. So you can uh, go to a semiconductor, excite over the band gap, and uh, you will get a, a missing uh, electron in the valence band and, a, and an extra electron in the conduction band. Now, is this, uh, does this uh, satisfy our condition? It does not. Because this is two fermions. This is a bound state of two fermions. Yes, one of them is a hole. One of them is an electron. Uh, but it is a kind of a mass two particle, charge zero, but mass two. And uh, for that reason, it is not even a fermion. It is a boson. So excitons are bosons. Uh, you can study Bose-Einstein condensation of excitons for example. So those are not Majoranas. 
So instead of a sum of an electron and a hole, or a bound state of an electron and a hole like a molecule, you have to take a superposition of an electron and a hole kind of in a single particle. So a particle that is one half electron, one half hole, like that half field circle. So a natural place to look for those is actually not a semiconductor, it is a superconductor. And the reason for that is because in superconductors, because of all this condensate of Cooper pairs, you can easily go from an electron to a hole by adding a Cooper pair. And so because you have this macroscopic quantum state, the condensate of Cooper pairs, where you c you doesn't matter what the charge is, you can uh, add charges in the units of two indefinitely. So you can start with a hole in a superconductor, like not this hole in a valence band, the conduction band, but in a superconductor just below the Fermi surface, and um, add a Cooper pair and convert that hole into an electron. Or you can say that in a superconductor there are only two states. One state is when in a superconductor there is an integer number of Cooper pairs, and the other state is when there is an extra one electron in a superconductor. And that costs you an energy of the size of the gap, superconducting gap, and that's an excited state. So then if you add another electron to the superconductor, well, you have uh, created another Cooper pair, so they will condense into the condensate. And that extra electron could be an electron or a hole. So this is a, this is a good area to look for Majoranas, electrons and holes, because we are looking for a superposition of electron and hole because we want a particle to be its own antiparticle, and, uh, and this is what you need for that. Okay, so let's take a superconductor, and um, this is a single particle confinement potential. So normally single particles, like I said, are, um, experience a gap of delta, a barrier to enter a superconductor, but let's suppose we've created a, a little uh, trap, like a quantum dot for single particles inside a superconductor, and that is actually a superconducting vortex. We did not talk about superconducting vortices, but let's just think about a little quantum dot for single particles inside a superconductor. A superconductivity is locally suppressed, and so here it is superconducting, so single particles cannot live, only Cooper pairs, and so you have to pay an energy delta if you're a single particle and you want to live here. Same here, and this is for holes. And uh, around here, you can be a single particle. But this, this is so small that um, it behaves like a quantum dot, so you can define individual quantum levels inside this little trap, this vortex. Now, because it's a superconductor, there is a particle hole symmetry. So gamma uh, dagger at E is equal to gamma at minus E. And that's why the spectrum is symmetric around zero. So that is a property of superconductors. But the problem is there cannot be a level at zero here at the symmetry point where E is zero and gamma dagger becomes gamma. And the particle becomes antiparticle. The reason why there cannot be a level at zero is just like in any potential trap, there are zero point motion. So in a harmonic oscillator, the lowest energy level is not at zero energy, it is at uh, one half, right, of the quantization energy. And that one half is fundamental to quantum mechanics, it comes from zero point motion. So there can never be a bound state at zero energy in such a trap. Unless you do something special, and uh, Volavik in 1999 recognized that if you don't take a, just any superconductor, but you take a 
<coughs> a special superconductor, which is called the P wave superconductor, then the zero point motion is canceled by the Berry phase in the, in the P wave superconductor. And there will be a stable energy level at zero energy. What's a P wave superconductor? Well, um, the superconductors that we mostly talked about in this course are called S wave. And that means that this gap, it is independent of momentum. In any direction we electrons fly, they see the same gap. And if it's P wave, it means that depending on momentum, in momentum space, the gap has different size uh, for different momenta. And so for some momenta, the gap is zero for Ky, and for Kx, it's maximum. And it maps out this P wave orbital in K space. And so if you go around such a, such a P wave, you pick up a phase shift of pi that cancels the zero point motion. And that's uh, this geometric phase consideration provides for a robust energy level pinned to zero in, the, in P wave superconductors. Now, this is very nice. And it was a nice reali realization. Except these P wave superconductors are hard to come by. In fact, convincingly, I would say we have less than one of them demonstrated convincingly in the lab. Uh, not, not the case um, for uh, superfluid helium-3. That is uh, widely acknowledged to be a P wave superfluid. But uh, in superconducting form, there are some strange materials like strontium ruthenate, uh, which may be P wave superconductors, but they're very difficult to work with. And um, so experimental progress in uh, finding these levels bound to zero for which this condition would satisfy is uh, so far fairly limited. So they might still achieve success, but not, not so far. So there's an alternative approach, uh, which is based on uh, one-dimensional P-wave superconducting wires. And that sounds even crazier. We don't even have uh, bulk P-wave superconductors. Now we need one-dimensional P-wave superconductors, right? Um, but turns out there is, a, there is a way, workaround, to engineer such a wire without actually having a real P-wave superconductor make an effective P-wave superconductor. So the message here is that to create Majorana fermions in solid state, you need a special unconventional P-wave superconductor. And uh, if you find a route to creating it, you will find Majoranas in it. OK, the rest of the talk will focus on this one-dimensional idea. And first, I will introduce this Kitayev's idea. Um, he uh, thought of this one-dimensional P-wave wire from the point of view of a toy model. The toy model included sites, and each site is a box here. And the site can be occupied by an electron. And then the sites are coupled, so you can hop O over this wire, and you can uh, make these sites interact. So you can just write down, OK, they interact via superconducting coupling, tunnel coupling. You can write down anything you like. This is a toy model, and we play with it. Now, why do these boxes have structure? They have structure because of course, each box is a fermion, and you can rewrite it as a sum of two Majorana particles. So I went ahead and I expanded each side of the, of the toy model, of the chain. And I uh, wrote down explicitly that each side contains two Majorana fermions. Now, under any normal circumstances, this is just purely a mathematical description. These two Majoranas, they're, they're just operators that describe one electron. If you want, they are so strongly coupled because they're on one side that they are 
interact so strongly that they are repelled from zero energy and they form a real fermion. <coughs> That's another description. But in a toy model, uh, we can just uh, take these boxes and we can shift them by one, but not by one box, by one star, like that. So what do we have now? Well, we have, okay, each box still has uh, two Majoranas, but now each two Majoranas belong to separate physical sites of the original model, of the original toy model. Look, these two guys were one fermion, and now the box has shifted. So now this is an electron, and this is an electron, this is an electron, and these guys at the ends, uh, yeah, they form one electron together, but they are very far apart because I can add more boxes here, right? It's a toy model. So how is this possible? Well, it wasn't just a toy model uh, at the level of drawing boxes around stars. Uh, he wrote in the P-wave coupling, just like Volovic did before him, and he figured out that if the electrons, the sites, are coupled by P-wave interaction rather than S-wave, the uniform interaction. Then this can be favored over this. So kind of Majoranas over sites are coupled. There's a gamma 1 times gamma 2 product that comes out. And uh, at the ends of the chain, the two guys are left. Now it's not even, even that simple. It's not just P wave that you have to have because if you just have this P wave superconductor, it's a triplet type superconductor. So in a Cooper pair, you couple electrons like this, like a singlet, but in a P wave superconductor, you couple them like that, like a triplet. But then of course there's a second triplet like that, which is uh, also allowed. And therefore on, on each side, there will be another copy so these are not separated in space. These are together. And that means that uh, at every site there are at least two Majoranas. So now I defeated my purpose of shifting boxes around because now on this side I have two Majoranas. On this side I have two Majoranas. They will couple, they form one electron, and we are done. We have not done anything interesting. So to have something interesting, it has to be a spinless P-wave superconductor to something that really doesn't exist, really doesn't exist. Spinless P-wave superconductor. So these electrons should have no spin. And then it's interesting because, you know, this is a really unique exotic situation where you can rip apart one electron and put half of it here and half of it on the other side of the universe. That's the interesting effect that we are after. That's arguably even more interesting than just demonstrating gamma 1 equal to gamma dagger. OK. <coughs> so P wave superconductors barely exist. Spinless P wave superconductors do not exist. But this kind of wire can be engineered. And this was a realization that uh, has taken about 10 years from the, from the Volovic and Kitaev. And there were many papers in between. It's not like people were just uh, mind, brain blocked for 10 years and then they, oh. No, there was a long evolution that uh, took us through quantum spin hole effect and uh, cold fermionic gases and uh, uh, P wave superconductors and various topological insulators. And, and so on and so forth. But um, these two recipes are unique because finally this toy Kitaev model was mapped onto something that uh, was so simple that it existed in, in the lab. And the recipe contains um, four ingredients. Together, these four ingredients create a spinless P wave superconductor. So that's what you need. And then when you create that, at the end, there will be these unpaired, unpaired Majorana fermions. 
So look at the list and remember the course. Remember the course. You know all of this. You know quantum point contacts, spin orbit interaction, you know uh, proximity effect and superconductivity. Okay, and uh, probably new magnetic field before you started the course. But let me just go through this again. In quantum point contacts, we have one dimensional subbands. One dimensional subbands are just parabolas. Parabolas form a staircase like that. And so <coughs> if you are trying to put current through these parabolas, you should have quantized steps, right? So the recipe for my Aranas requires to have one, maybe two, three, a few of these quantized modes in the wire. The second one, spin-orbit interaction, you know what that is. It takes the spin degenerate one-dimensional subbands, and it lifts spin degeneracy, but in a special way, not like magnetic field, which does this, splits the Zeeman parabolas in energy. It splits them like that, because spin-orbit interaction is sigma times k, spin times momentum. So if you have only one dimension, k, then spin times k will produce this, because for two spins you will have shift in this direction, shift in that direction. So now spin degeneracy is lifted everywhere except this one point. <coughs> and then superconductivity, when you induce superconductivity in such a wire, superconductivity will open gaps. It will open gaps around the zero bias, around Fermi energy. So uh, all the bands that we're going through, they will become gapped. So here we have three crossings. All crossings will, will get gaps. And now magnetic field. <coughs> magnetic field plays an interesting role in all this. Because you see we're trying to simulate a P-wave superconductor. But this superconductivity is not P wave, it's conventional. It's aluminum, niobium, it's what we discussed before. The gap is isotropic. And so we're trying to create a triplet superconductivity out of a singlet superconductivity. So magnetic field, it polarizes the spins like that. And that so that's required. But that creates a problem because if you induce conventional superconductivity and turn on magnetic field, this effect and this effect will compete and normally superconductivity is just destroyed. It's called pair breaking. You have a Cooper pair flying like that and they're happy in a Cooper pair and then all of a sudden one of the spins is flipped. This is no longer considered a Cooper pair in a conventional superconductor. So these electrons don't interact, and superconductivity is reduced, and this gap, it is suppressed. This gap is suppressed. So the same thing happens here. You turn on the magnetic field, and this gap goes to zero. The point at which it goes to zero is when the Zeeman splitting is equal to the gap. So pretty much you apply magnetic field to close the gap. But it's not so simple, the story. Because there's this ingredient, spin-orbit interaction. Spin-orbit interaction, it uh, mixes spins. It mixes spin up and spin down. It makes them fuzzy. They're no longer eigenstates. Right? It, it, uh, allows some freedom <coughs> for spins. And so it protects superconductivity from being destroyed by magnetic field. So if you adjust the right balance between these three guys, spin orbit, superconductivity, and magnetic field, then you keep increasing field, and the gap has closed, and then it opens again. So the superconductivity is brought back, but it is now become P wave and it has become spinless P-wave 
because magnetic field has lifted the spin degeneracy. So there is no second spin. So by this kind of uh, reasoning, you have, cr you have created spinless P-wave superconductivity. You have to go kind of in circles here to, to realize this. And there are some nuances. For example, magnetic field has to be perpendicular to spin orbit field for this to work. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Otherwise, these two fields add together, and there is no mixing effect of the two spins. Now, why do you need one-dimensional wire? Why cannot it be just a piece of semiconductor, a two-deg? That's because we want to have a single Majorana. We want to have a single isolated Majorana. If there were zillions of modes here, there would be a Majorana mode flowing on the edge. And uh, that wouldn't be a single particle. So this way, it is a single um, quasi-particle described by this gamma dagger equal gamma relation. Any questions? You look a little bit confused. So let me demystify this. Uh, and uh, I mean, uh, this is a really simple formula. You have to appreciate it. This is the same ingredients, just written in a, in a math form. This Hamiltonian is really simple. First of all, it is single particle. There is no many body, Green's function, Feynman diagram, renormalization theory, uh, any of that. S it's a single particle problem. And it has four terms, just like in the recipe, the kinetic energy and the chemical potential for one dimensional particle. This is spin orbit interaction, momentum and spin, and this is Zeeman field, and this is superconductivity. That's it. So you put these four things together, you solve the Schrodinger equation for a one dimensional system, and you get at the ends of the system the two bound states at the ends, which are my Rana fermions. So it's really simple. The concept is a little bit uh, mind-bending uh, if it is first described to you, but it is not mysterious. And here, once again, what I said in words, now illustrated in graphs. These are the spectra uh, when I include spin orbit and superconductivity and magnetic field. Um, so already the subbands are split like that. That's why we see double here. And uh, we have the gaps. And now the interplay of Zeeman energy and the gap, the superconducting gap, will control this, this energy here. So when the Zeeman energy is equal to the gap, here there is no gap in the center at zero momentum. The gap is closed. And this is a perfect Dirac dispersion relation around zero, by the way. This is a Dirac spectrum. And then when Zeeman energy is larger than the gap, again, the, the gap is open. Now what's the difference between this graph and this graph? If you look at the graphs, they are actually identical. I may have even copy-pasted them from left to right. Now I'm not sure. Maybe I've calculated them. But uh, in any case, they are identical. And, uh, but there is a fundamental difference between them. Because to go from here to here, I had to close a gap and reopen it again. So I cannot go continuously from here to here. I have to go through a transition. And it's a topological transition. because. In the bulk of the nanowire, a gap has to close and then reopen. And in fact, you cannot see it from the spectrum. But here, because gap closed and reopened, it actually closed and the bands have inverted. 
So the bands that were like that here, they are like that here. And so the gap that you see here is actually negative. It's a negative gap phase. It's a negative gap superconductor. That is also what P wave superconductor is. It has a negative gap. And um, in the field of uh, Majoranus, this negative gap superconductor is called a topological superconductor. That's the name. It's the same as a P wave superconductor. So when you're in a topological superconductor state, topological superconductor will have two edge states which sit exactly at zero energy. And so they satisfy the condition for a Majorana fermion. And they are one electron shared between two sides. So they are these strange particles that are half electron, half a hole. And uh, they are actually like Bogolubov quasi-particles right at the center of the superconducting gap, if you remember about Bogolubov quasi-particles. Bogolubov quasi-particles are superpositions of electrons and holes. And uh, when they are exactly at the symmetry point, they are equal superpositions of electrons and holes. So then when you go through a transition, uh, you start closing the gap. And at some point, you've closed the gap. And at that point, the Majoranas, they extend throughout the phase. Uh, you can say that uh, the size of the Majorana is inversely proportional to the gap. And so when the gap becomes 0, Majorana becomes infinitely large. And so then uh, there is a, <coughs> at the, right at the transition, there is this Majorana mode in the entire wire. And then when you keep increasing the parameter, you open the gap. Now we're in a trivial state, the positive gap. There are no Majoranas at the edges. And this mode, it has been absorbed into the continuum. So this extra electron that was shared between the two edges, it is now absorbed there. So then you can increase. And uh, as a function of some parameter, gate or field, chemical potential, you can uh, open and close the gap again. And when you make it negative again, Majoranas will appear. So these are, this is us going in and out of the topological phase transition. And so to create Majorana fermions, uh, you need to go through the topological phase transition. A gate gap must close. Now let's try to map this onto an experiment. Um, this is our system from the recipe, one dimensional wire. A superconductor induces superconductivity here by proximity. So we take a wire with spin orbit interaction, a semiconductor, proximity induced superconductivity, like we discussed in the course. We apply magnetic field. And let's suppose that we were able to enter this topological superconducting state with a negative gap and two Majorana fermions at the edges. Now a way to measure this thing is to try to tunnel into this state. And this state is at zero energy. So you should see a peak at zero bias in tunneling. That's the simple statement. So a particular way to do this tunneling experiment is to um, sort of build it inside the same wire. On this side of the wire, you can create a tunnel probe. The green gate can pinch off the barrier here and uh, create a potential, potential barrier for electrons to tunnel over. And so from this contact, you can apply voltage and you can drain a current into the superconductor. And this will then become the tunneling experiment. Our particular <coughs> mechanism for tunneling through this Majorana state is Andreev reflection. That we also covered in the course. So basic Andreev reflection goes like this. Suppose you come uh, as an electron to the superconductor. You cannot go in because there is a gap. Right? 
you have to pay a lot of energy to go in. But you can do this uh, strange Andre reflection process where you go back as a whole and a Cooper pair is transferred into the superconductor. And this way, a current of 2E is transferred into the superconductor. So if you are inside the gap, <coughs> you will get a little bit of current through, and it is determined by the strength of the tunnel barrier here. But then if you, are, if you try to do this at higher energy above the gap, you can just go through and that the current is proportional to the tunneling barrier in the first power. Then there is an anomaly at the gap edge. So this experiment will tell you the size of the gap. It will tell you the Andrea reflection probability from this, from this amplitude. And this is how tunneling into superconductors works. <coughs> now in the presence of Majorana. In the presence of Majorana, here we have a gap. And the Majorana is a, is a level at zero energy. So this is quite unique because now inside the superconductor, in the bulk, there is a level at zero energy, but it is accessible for single electrons, not for Cooper pairs, but for single particles. So you do uh, a kind of a strange Andrea reflection. If you go anywhere here at any of this bias, you go conventional Andrea reflection. But if you are at zero, where Majorana sits, then you come in as an electron. You reflect as a whole but both have the same energy because you are at zero energy, you are at zero bias. So both go through exactly the same tunnel barrier. And that's why you have a very strong peak because it's a resonant transmission process. This is analogous to quantum dots in the following way. Suppose you have a quantum dot with two barriers and some levels in, inside. Now let's suppose you tunnel from here to the level and out. If the level is misaligned or if the two barriers are not equal height, you will get through, but the height of the peak will be um, somewhat low because you have to multiply this probability by this probability and do the whole uh, a quasi-classical calculation to get the current through such a dot. But there is a unique situation when this barrier is exactly the same height as this and the, all the levels, the Fermi level here, here, and here are all on resonance. When everything is on resonance, there is a resonance transmission and uh, the transmission is perfect. So the conductance through such a configuration is exactly 2e squared over h. So here we have, uh, nominally, we have exactly that. Because at zero energy, electron and the whole which reflects see exactly the same barrier, because it's ex physically the same barrier. It's always the same. And uh, the levels are all aligned, because this one is at zero energy, and the bias here is at zero energy. So this is a, like a resonant tunneling process in a quantum dot. And so you expect to see a peak which is not just a peak, but also quantized at 2e squared over h, a quantized conductance peak. And if you're in, in a non-topological state, you expect to see nothing or some small Andre of tunneling current. OK. So now. Uh, let's review, <coughs> in particular, uh, experimental data from Delft. And um, the first thing I'm going to show you is that these four ingredients uh, we can independently demonstrate in, uh, in an in a experimental system used in Delft. Uh, it's an indium antimonide nanowire. So uh, it is shown here. And the first thing I show is uh, that it's a one-dimensional quantum wire. So it has conductance quantization. So we put two contacts on this wire. There is a back gate. 
global gate that tunes conductance through the entire wire. And uh, you do a sweep of conductance, and the axes don't show up, but this is e squared over h, 2 e squared over h, 3 e squared over h. Why is it not 2 e squared over h, 4 e squared over h, 6 e squared over h? That's right. We are at high magnetic field. Okay. So it's a spin resolved plateaus. Now, what do you think about these plateaus? Do they convince you or not? Is it quantized already? I see one uh, skeptical uh, body language. I see two. Nobody is too optimistic. Well, I would say this plateau is quite convincing. This one has some resonances. This one is uh, maybe wishful thinking. Yeah? And you can appreciate that it is very hard to demonstrate conductance quantization if you have a nanowire. You have to remember why. Because uh, for conductance quantization, you have to pass electrons from here to here. But if they see any amount of scattering, they will go back and back and forward. And who knows how they're going to go. And that will create some suppressions in conductance or increases resonances. Uh, and so uh, these perfect quantization will, will be violated. It is not robust. These plateaus are not robust. They're sensitive to the environment around QPCs. So when you work with two-dimensional electron gases, after the constriction, they open up, and electrons fly out of the constrictions, and they never come back. They never fly back inside. So you have these beautiful quantized steps. And here in a nanowire, they have nowhere to go but back. So it is quite difficult to demonstrate this. But I have some more data that looks more convincing, at least to me. And you tell me what you think. So this is on the same sample. But this is now bias versus gate. And this is a waterfall plot. So the trace that uh, at, zero bias, at zero bias was this. This was the conductance plateaus. And you can see that, indeed, the first one looks pretty sharp. Here there is some uh, uncertainty. And this one is not so clear. Yeah, remember these curves of conductance versus bias. These are all IV traces, differentiated. And uh, they have no offsets. So whenever there is a compression, it means you change the gate, but the conductance doesn't change. So it means you have plateaus. But look, there is a periodic checkerboard pattern of these plateaus that is uh, quite difficult to interpret other than that is conductance quantization. So from a single trace, I would say, yeah, maybe. But when I see that there is a plateau here, and as here at half a bias, there are more plateaus uh, at, at higher bias. And here again, in between this and these transitions, then I say, yes, this is conductance quantization. And I can even count the number of modes. It's about uh, three in this case. Three spin resolved, so really two. Two subbands. And these wires, uh, we uh, analyze them pretty carefully. So you have, a, for example, you can extract a mean-free path of 300 nanometers for the diameter of the wire of 100 nanometers. So it means electrons bounce a few times back and forth of the wire before they scatter back. And, th and this is quite remarkable for nanowires. So these are pretty clean wires. OK, that was conductance quantization. Now spin-orbit interaction. What's this a trace of? These kind of oscillations? Robbie. Robbie. Yeah, these are Rabi oscillations. These are not just Rabi oscillations. These are Rabi oscillations induced by electric fields on one of the gates. So this is a, a Rabi oscillation driven by moving the electron around. And that motion is converted into an effective spin orbit field. So this is a Rabi oscillations in a spin orbit qubit. So 
we knew already pretty early on that this wire would have spin orbit interaction because we use it to operate spin orbit qubits. <coughs> um, and uh, spin orbit qubits were pretty fast, running at 100 megahertz Rabi frequency. So we were uh, quite optimistic that spin orbit interaction is rather strong. I'll get to some numbers uh, a little bit later. But first, I want to show you that uh, not only we know the magnitude of this interaction, but also the direction. So spin orbit interaction mixes uh, spin states. So if you have spin states like singlet and triplet, uh, and you bring them to degeneracy like is done here, so this is a singlet and this is a triplet, and here at the degeneracy point, they anticross. This is in a quantum dot with two electrons. And so the singlet and the triplet states belong to different orbitals because a, of the Pauli principle. Um, and so at zero magnetic field, there is an energy difference. A singlet state is down and a triplet state is up. And then as you increase magnetic field, a triplet state splits in, uh, in energy for higher and higher fields. And it comes in resonance with, uh, with the singlet at some point. So from this magnitude of this anticrossing, you can extract the strength of spin orbit interaction. <coughs> and if you rotate magnetic field, you can see that for one orientation of magnetic field, there is a large anticrossing. And if you rotate by 90 degrees, it's basically gone. So that is because if you align external field with spin orbit field, then the coupling effect of triplet and singlet induced by spin orbit interaction is, is disappeared because the two fields simply add to each other. And so they are along the same quantization axis. They define the same spin states. So they no longer mix singlets and triplets. But this is very handy because when you see this, you know which way the spin orbit field is pointing. It is pointing in the direction of the external field here, like that. And so this direction, it happened to be perpendicular to the nanowire and in the plane of the substrate. And that is consistent with the Rajba effect because here electrons move along the nanowire so that's the momentum. Electric field is out of plane from, uh, from the gates. And that it makes it reasonable that the vector product of this and this would produce a field like that. So Rajba mechanism. And from the magnitude of this uh, gap, we could extract the spin orbit length, which is also a few hundred nanometers. So the same order as the mean free path. It's so all the same order, all these lengths. Now what matters for my Orionis is how far these parabolas are split in the one dimensional band structure. <coughs> in particular, this energy matters. This is called the bulk spin orbit energy. And it's calculated by taking the spin orbit length and doing uh, this uh, conversion. So if you take 200 nanometers, you will get the spin orbit energy is just 50 microvolts. It's actually not so large. It's about one Kelvin scale. If you want to see, take advantage of this interaction, you have to cool down your system below one Kelvin. That's the message. And so we have covered that we have uh, one-dimensional wires, quantum point contacts with spin orbit interaction. And uh, now we will induce superconductivity. The way you do that is fairly simple. You take a nanowire, you clean the surface, you etch it or bombard it with ions, and you deposit a superconductor on top. So you want a very clean interface for Cooper pairs to go into the semiconductor.
But then once you've done that, here we have two superconducting contacts. And what you can see when you have two superconducting contacts separated by a non-superconducting material, you can see Josephson effect, right? So maybe you can see a little bit here that here on the, on the current scale, on the current axis, you ramp up the current, but there is no voltage developing until some critical current when there is a jump and you switch into the running state of this junction. And if you go back at a lower current, you switch back. So there is a hysteresis. Uh, so that means this is an underdamped Josephson junction. Remember the washboard potential? If, the, if you're in an underdamped regime, if your resistance is too high, or capacitance is too um, low, high, high, then you are in an underdamped regime. Now, okay, so this is a supercurrent, a very low contact resistance. This is what you need, kilo ohm. You cannot really get ohms uh, if you couple this to a, between a superconductor and a semiconductor, at least we couldn't. This kind of a one kilo ohm is a, is a good number. Now this graph proves that um, supercurrent really flowing through the semiconductor. This is now a plot of a derivative dVdi. Yeah? So these are IV traces, but differentiated. And uh, uh, never mind the details, this red line is the supercurrent. That's when there, there is a robust switch in an in a IV curve. And in a DVDI, there is a bright pixel. And as you change the gate voltage, uh, you can see that the supercurrent is changing. So you cannot gate tune the, the metal, the superconductor. It has to be a semiconductor that you can change the density in and you can affect the supercurrent. So when you see a gate dependence, means that you're flowing a supercurrent through a semiconductor. So that's very important. But for my runners, we don't want supercurrents. We want to do a tunneling experiment. And we want one contact to be normal and one contact to be superconducting. So this is a final device that was developed to implement a Majorana tunneling experiment. All the ingredients are here. Indium and timonite nanowire. And um, by the way, not only it has a large spin orbit interaction, it also has a huge G factor of order 50, so very large. And so means that you can apply a very small magnetic field and create a very large energy difference between spin up and spin down. So very small field is enough to lift the spin degeneracy and create the spinless part in the spinless P-wave superconductor. Uh, and that's very good news because remember superconductivity does not like magnetic fields. And so we were worried about our superconductor that if we put it in high magnetic fields, uh, it will uh, be suppressed. Just the bulk superconductor, not the induced one, even the bulk. But then we kind of double, did a double safety and used a really killer superconductor, niobium titanium nitride. This thing, you cannot even suppress it. So uh, you know, the magnet that we had, it went to 10 Tesla, and you cannot kill this superconductivity. The, in fact, this is uh, stronger than the wire that the magnet is made of. So, so before this goes normal, this, the magnet itself will go normal. So the, um, you know, we were in good shape <laughs> in terms of protecting this superconductivity. But um, nevertheless, the, the combination of materials was, was chosen with some thought in mind to, to have, a, have robust superconductivity induced in this, in this semiconductor. <coughs> okay, so 
the superconductor, the semiconductor. Here underneath there are all these gates. So you can see the best, these bright shapes. These are very narrow, 50 nanometer wide gates. And um, for example, one of them, maybe this one or this one, you can use to create a tunnel barrier here. So make it very negative here and separate this part of the device from this part of the device, such that there is only a very high tunnel barrier left and electrons are forced to tunnel across. So we are realizing this tunneling experiment where we expect to see the zero bias peak if there is a Majorana living right here. Why right here? Well, because now this is supposed to be the topological superconducting state. Coming back to the first part of the talk, superconductor, semiconductor with strong spin orbit, apply magnetic field along this axis in the right proportion of parameters, there should be one Majorana here, one Majorana here, and a negative gap in this bulk. So that was the idea. By the way, you can also see that the superconductor covers just one half of the nanowire. From the nanotechnology point of view, that is a little bit tricky um, because you have to align this, this is a 100 nanometer cylinder over one micron. You have to align this shape of metal with the axis of that cylinder. But it can be done. And the reason for that is that here we also have gates. You, it's hard to see on this screen, but there are big gates here. And if the metal completely covers the semiconductor, then these gates, they don't couple to, this, uh, to the semiconductor. Because the metal, it will screen the semiconductor. All the electric field lines from the gates will just go into the metal, not into the semiconductor. So it's just electrostatic considerations. OK, any questions here? Good. So this is once again the schematic that I have already shown you conceptually, but now with a real device, uh, a tunnel barrier, a variable chemical potential here, uh, as suspected Majorana, maybe some other states, and <coughs> all of that lives inside the gap. And outside the gap, we have just normal conduction. So you can do a test run at zero magnetic field and verify that we see something that theory predicts. And indeed, like I showed you before, you can see some conductance inside the gap. Then you can see the ears the BCS ears and some other level outside. This is the normal conductance and this is the size of the gap. So this is a proof that the tunneling experiment works and that we are tunneling into the superconductor. And there is no state at zero bias in this uh, configuration. Again, the scale is missing, but this is 200 microvolts, 400 microvolts kind of scale. OK, so let's turn on the magnetic field. That's our last ingredient. And this graph is the, uh, the reason why I'm giving a lecture, perhaps. Um, once again, here, starting from zero field going to about half a Tesla in this case, the curves are offset by 10 millitesla, and they're also offset on purpose from each other, so uh, not like a waterfall plot in a QPC, uh, they are physically offset. So that you could see that in the first few traces, till about 100 millitesla, around zero bias, there is no peak, and then the peak appears, and it lives for a few hundred millitesla, then it disappears, uh, some other structure appears, and here at the sides, that's the superconducting gap induced in the nanowire, 250 microvolts. 
Now, this peak is not 2, two e squared over h. It's uh, one-tenth of that, or, or even 5%. Why? You can tune it to be one-tenth. Um, that is not a big deal. I will explain to you why. The most remarkable thing is that it, it, does, it is not there at zero field, then it appears, and then it does not deviate from zero bias for a very long range of field. I will explain to you that this range of field is really very long. And so this is really indicating towards the direction that these are edge states of a, of a bulk phase that are pinned to zero bias by the bulk phase, by the topological phase, rather than some levels that have spin or tunable by chemical potential, etc. So in this way, this peak is, is uh, kind of remarkable. This slide and the previous slide is same, same from the one side, right? So this one and the next one is same? Uh, roughly the same. Maybe slightly different gate tuning. Because there we, we also have some peaks around the smaller one and the next one we don't have. Yeah, maybe we do still have some structure, yeah. OK, so this is another representation of, uh, of this data. This is a diff slightly different regime again, a little bit retuned. And it's in color scale. But it shows the same thing. Here is a superconducting gap. And the intensity varies. Uh, that's the trick with color plots. They can fool you. But uh, the feature remains here. And the same with the zero bias peak. It onsets about here. And interestingly, about where the Zeeman energy is equal to the to delta. And that is of the order of magnitude of where we expect the topological phase to appear, of a factor of 1.5 within that condition. And so these bright pixels here are the zero bias peak. And it's also here. You just cannot see it. And it continues for about 0.9 Tesla. And 0.9 Tesla is about 1.4 millivolts. So what is 1.4 millivolts? Well, again, all my axes are gone, but this is 500 microvolts, plus minus 500 microvolts. So this is 1 millivolt. Sorry, this is, uh, this is 250, so this is 800. So this is half of this, about half. And this peak is 30 microvolts wide. So this is a super narrow peak that just sticks to zero over a huge range of field of 0.9 Tesla. I think all the labels are white. <laughs> That's why you cannot see them. Uh, so I have to tell you all the numbers. So this is uh, 0.9 Tesla, 0, 0.1. And uh, another thing you can see here is this uh, huge cross where two states are going through zero. Don't know what these states are. Don't care. What I know is that they have spin. They have spin because this slope is uh, roughly the g-factor of indium antimonide, the g-factor of 50. For a small field difference of about 100 millitesla, it just crosses this entire screen, and it's gone. And this is a sharp contrast with this state not moving at all. So it is spinless, has no spin. So you can do a temperature dependence from the width, full width of half max, Remember the thermometry you can do with quantum dots. You can take the, the peak, the Coulomb peak, and do the full width of half max and convert it into temperature. You can do the same here. And you realize that this peak is temperature broadened because the temperature in this fridge was about 60 millikelvin. And uh, the peak is about uh, 20 to 30 microvolts wide. So if you work it out, you have to do 3.5 kBT. And you will get about this width. 
Oh, and the axes are missing again, but this is 100 microvolts. <laughs> Sorry. OK, and it disappears at a, uh, about half a Kelvin. So it just broadens and merges into, into the background. So the peak is temperature broadened. <coughs> and this is the reason why it is not 2e squared over h. So this was the first thing that all the theorists realized. First they all said, oh, but your peak is not quantized. Uh, and then they thought for a second and then said, oh, but you probably have finite temperature, so it's OK. Uh, so it turns out only at zero temperature it has to be quantized. And so when you introduce finite temperature, the prediction is that the peak will be something small and wide, broadened by temperature, and, uh, and shrunk way down. So the gray lines here, the gray spike here, is the zero temperature prediction, zero width. And quantize at one is squared over h, or two is squared over h, uh, and the, the dark trace is the finite temperature prediction. So actually, in 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 any real situation, we will never see a quantized peak. So that is a bad signature to look for. Conductance quantization will never work here. OK. <coughs> so the last thing um, I want to show you on the data side is that um, we put all the ingredients together, and then we saw some zero bias peaks. Uh, and the peaks behaved uh, very much like Majorana. So it was very encouraging. We went then one step ahead, and we decided to take out some ingredients and see if the peak still appears. And the, the one that is easiest to take out is actually spin-orbit interaction. Because remember, all you have to do is rotate the field. And if you rotate both fields point in the same direction, spin-orbit and the external field, then the bands, they don't exhibit this anti-crossing. They rather just shift like that together. And you have this... Uh, four bands crossing the Fermi level at every level. And that means that the superconductor is always spinful. It's never spinless. So here, if you are inside this gap, you only have two bands, and you've lifted the fermion doubling. So you have made it spinless. Uh, that's, the, that's the fancy words for saying that only, only two times you have the crossing of the Fermi level, but not here. So when you rotate, <coughs> indeed, the external field to the spin orbit field, that you go from a zero bias peak to nothing. And we knew this direction from previous experiments. So it all was very consistent. And in fact, you can do it over all 4 pi. And you find that, for example, if you rotate in the, in, in the plane perpendicular to spin orbit field, that you always get a, a peak for all angles. And finally, as a, as a word of caution, uh, we also have to be careful that there are many different ways to get zero bias peaks in uh, mesoscopic systems that were already known before. And this is an incomplete list of maybe the simplest ones that first come up in literature searches and uh, in discussions. And uh, they're on top of your mind. And uh, um, I'm just going to tell you now that uh, they are very easy to rule out for this experiment. Um, and uh, if there are more sophisticated explanations that don't involve Majoranas, then uh, there has to be a more detailed comparison between the data and the and the theory, and there are a couple out there which are very intriguing that try to emulate the data without any Majorana. So this is a, really an ongoing discussion at this stage, and there are several other experiments which I must say should really carefully look at this list up here, not at, at this list down here. But I am going to show you just this one, the Kondo effect here. So Kondo effect, if you remember, that's a if you have a spin in a quantum dot and uh, you have a 
leads, and th those leads, if they are coupled to the dot, they will try to screen that spin. So if the spin is up, leads will try to be down. They will try to form a little cloud of electrons that are mostly down. And so on average, spin will be zero. It's a dynamic many-body state, and it creates a resonance at zero bias through co-tunneling. But if you apply magnetic field and that spin in a quantum dot, it splits into spin up and spin down, there become two levels, then th you get two copies of this condo effect. And so this condo effect, it is not robust to magnetic field, it splits. So it splits with a G factor. And what would happen if this condo effect would be in the indium antimonide, it would maybe start at zero field and it would split like a black line. So you would have a zero bias peak here, and it would do this. And in contrast, our zero bias peak just stays like that. And here, the, the pink lines show a G factor of 2, because a free electron has a G factor of 2. And what if there was a little impurity on the surface of the wire that accidentally coupled to the nanowire states in a quantum dot that's outside? An electron has a G factor not of, of the semiconductor, but of its own. Uh, and that would be most likely two. And even that smaller G factor, you can still distinguish uh, from the zero bias peak. So this is how you rule out these explanations uh, that come from other effects. OK. There is a program for the near future. There is a program for the Long term, the field is very lively. There are several hundred papers that came out in a year in this field, and uh, several of them are experimental. Um, some of the things are missing. For example, uh, I told you that the gap should close when you, when you start seeing Majoranas. But nobody sees the closing of this gap. So what's going on? Yeah. So that is a big question, remains to be answered. And there are other questions to answer. This is a question that uh, currently is being answered. Where is the second Majorana, right? So we, we have built an experiment on this side and looking for this Majorana and saw some zero bias peaks. Great, but remember, Majoranas have to always come in pairs because the universe cannot accept half an electron anywhere. If there is a half an electron here, there has to be another half somewhere. So, or you can say that if this is a topological superconducting state, it has two edges, and both edges should have edge states. So you build another experiment identical on the other side and try to tunnel into here and see the second zero bias peak. So that is a simple question that you can try to answer as the immediate follow-up. And I think here I have to stop. Um, I thank you for attending the course. I hope you found it useful. Um, good luck in your studies and in your research.